Happy Monday, everybody. Um, happy Thanksgiving as well. It's Thanksgiving week in 2017. So today is Monday, um, November 20th. I thank you very much for joining me, and it seems like iodine might be kind of a hot topic. I'm kind of excited to talk to you about it today. I've actually written an article that I have right here that's about four pages long, all about iodine, and that's going to go out in um, my emails that I try to send out on a regular basis. Um, so if you haven't signed up for them, make sure that you go to drkellyfelmer.com and you can sign up to get some of my emails. I'm trying to resend some things on Facebook because I know not everybody is on Facebook. You may find that strange, but there's a lot of people who, you know, say, I don't want to be on Facebook and that's perfectly fine. But there is so much information to talk about iodine. And I put out that little teaser yesterday to tell you what are we going to talk about. Good morning, Becky. Nice to see you. Happy Monday. Um, but I got a lot of comments on it. And, you know, the teaser was about if you have a thyroid problem, you need iodine. If you have a breast problem or if you're fearing breast cancer, you need iodine. If you have a prostate problem or testicular problem, every single one of your endocrine organs needs iodine. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. I'll give a little disclaimer to say if you're tuning in because you have autoimmune thyroid disease, I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how in iodine. But really, I think I need a whole long session just to talk about autoimmune disease and iodine because there are a lot of myths or misinformation about that. And so when I go into detail about that, or people who work with me um, get to have that extra advantage of getting that kind of detail. But we'll, we'll touch it for sure. There's just a lot of information. And really, I want to explain how the thyroid gland specifically works and uses iodine to explain how it does not cause or make worse autoimmune thyroid disease. The people out there who are telling you that it does make it worse don't understand how the thyroid gland works. Okay, so let's get back to the basics of iodine. You've all had iodine in your homes, right? Or at least maybe do you remember it growing up? This is one bottle of iodine that I have in my house. And um, you can see I'm, I'm twirling it around a little bit so you can see that orangey type um, coloring to it. And you can see as well that I still have some on my fingers because I was playing in the iodine. Um, and my husband and I are remodeling in a bathroom, so he got some cuts on his fingers and I put iodine on it. Do you remember that when you were growing up as you were a kid? You know, give me some likes. Tell me that you remember it. Oh, look, I got it on this hand too. Um, and the reason iodine used to be used all the time, in fact, it was the number one thing given out at the um, apothecary or at the drugstore. Iodine, iodine, iodine was used for so many different ailments. Um, good morning, Cindy and Clarissa. Thanks, everybody who is already joining on. Remember, give me some likes and remember to share it if you feel like somebody else could benefit. Hi, Nancy, Joan, and Kim. So good morning and happy Monday to you guys. But do you remember using iodine as a child? And what was the disadvantage? Two big disadvantages of using iodine in your house. My husband can vouch for it because one of the cuts that I put it on, he's like, oh, that burns. Do you remember your parents torturing you that I'm going to put iodine on that cut? And you're like, no, because it hurts. But though that is one of the great advantages of iodine that we're going to talk about because it's antibacterial, it's antifungal, it gets rid of parasites, it gets rid of um, the viruses, it detoxifies your body. Iodine is wonderful and it does a great job for cuts. But now let me show you one other thing. Um, do you see? I got a whole bunch of iodine on my arm. That's weird. I put it there on purpose and I put some on my husband's too. And um, I took a picture of it this morning and I'm watching how long it takes for it to disappear. Hmm. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Good morning, Dr. Matt. Hi, Jenna and Kim. Thanks everybody for joining. So let's talk more about iodine. Some of you um, 
it's really important to know that whenever you're going to take iodine, you also need to be taking salt. Did you know that? And we have to talk about how deficient people are in iodine. Those are some of the key things that I want you to know about. Absolutely, Cindy. I remember that now too, using it a ton on the calves, um, navels on the dairy farm, or even for um, the cow's nipples that would get raw or that would um, have a problem um, with uh, the calves sucking too much or getting a little raw with the equipment. It is a great healer. Um, Matt, Dr. Matt, you say, good to take daily for wellness purposes? Absolutely. Let's get exactly into that and the reason, the reasons why. So most people know and understand or first think about the thyroid gland, which is right here. And that medical condition that is known worldwide called a goiter. What is a goiter? Your thyroid gland swells and you can Google goiter and you're going to find pictures that just have a humongous thyroid gland right here. Wow. That was the first clue to say, what's going on there? Why is the thyroid doing that? Do any of you know why the thyroid gets so huge? It's related to iodine deficiency and it's a physical process the thyroid is growing, it's getting bigger because it's trying to get more blood flow. It's trying to absorb more iodine that's passing through um, the bloodstream. And so it gets larger to try to suck up some of that iodine. The body is adjusting to a physical state that it's going through when you're iodine deficient. There are many studies out there. I'm going to refer a lot to Dr. David uh, Brownstein. He is an expert on iodine and salt. He is a medical doctor out of Michigan, and he's written um, several books, I think like 17 different books. But he's got a whole book on iodine, as well as a whole book on salt. But I get a lot of my materials from the research that he's done but also places like um, the World Health Organization and the, um, where is it, National Health and Nutritional Survey reports that iodine levels have declined by 50% from 1971 to 2012. 50% decrease in iodine levels. And guess what has dramatically gone up? Every disease process that's affected by iodine. So thyroid disease, thyroid cancer, breast disease, breast cancer, those specifically prostate cancer, endometrium, pancreatic, and ovarian cancers are the specifically one in the NHANES studies where they do that research where they evaluate the whole population across the nation to evaluate um, different nutritional things and disease profiles, etc. But between 1971 and 2012, 50% decrease in iodine and then the reciprocal, tons of increase in all of those cancers and disease processes because people are deficient in iodine. So a goiter is a really simple thing that we have seen in many different um, people, a health condition. You know, there used to be a goiter belt, specifically us who live in the Midwest, because we had less resources of the seafood, which is a great source of iodine. Um, I brought one little example of something that I keep in my house, some seaweed. Who eats seaweed and kelp? That's a good source of iodine for you. It's really not enough to get rid of hypothyroidism. You need a lot more. Um, but it's an example for you because it's always better if you can get your nutritional needs through your foods versus taking a supplement. But I take a supplement daily because I need it and I have autoimmune disease and it did not flare my Hashimoto's. It is a key component to me getting my Hashimoto's and those antibodies under control and keeping it under control. Okay. I've gotten way off of, I had this programmed perfectly of everything that I wanted to tell you today and now I've gone all off in <laughs> different areas because I'm so excited to tell you about all these different things, all of these different things. So you guys have shown me that you're really pretty interested in iodine. What do you need to know? The thyroid gland holds about 50 milligrams when it's saturated with iodine. That's a lot. That's definitely a lot. And it um, is the 
organ that uses iodine the most. But then all of you women out there, I remember going and when I was a teenager and getting my first exam and pap and, you know, breast exam and that was really weird and strange, but the medical doctor told me I had fibrocystic breasts. I'm like, oh my God, what, what is that? What does, what does that mean? And, you know, oh, that's, that's nothing. It just means the tissues in, in your breasts are lumpy. So there, it's not like there was a nodule for a breast cancer and a, a breast cancer nodule is like finding a little hard pee in the tissues in your breast when you do a breast self exam. So this was more like, no, the, the tissue just feels it's harder here. It's kind of lumpy, you know, kind of bigger in one area and not another. So very asymmetrical from that perspective when you do an exam, not that anybody visually could see that. I'm like, oh my God, I'm 16 years old and you're telling me this. And oh, there's nothing to do about that. Absolutely wrong. This is one of the key, key things that iodine does in your body. It is responsible for the makeup of those tissues, for the makeup of the tissues here in your thyroid gland. To get a goiter to go down, to get under control, you need iodine. It needs to get saturated with iodine to settle down. Your breast tissue are the next most important one, not most important, but the, the next one that uses the highest amount of iodine. No one ever told me to take iodine. You know what? If my medical doctor would have told me to take iodine when I was 16 years old, I probably wouldn't have a thyroid condition right now. I already had signs of, of deficiency in iodine with fibrocystic breasts. Think how that could have changed my life my outcome, my disease processes, but that also means I probably wouldn't be here right now talking to you about iodine and working the way that I do because I wouldn't have the life experiences that I have. So God puts things in place for you sometimes so that you can learn and you can grow. And now here I am always sharing my story and things that I have learned from my experiences. When I started to take iodine, when I finally got smart enough, when I finally researched enough, and when I finally felt comfortable enough because there's so much scary stuff about iodine, you do not need to be afraid of iodine. I don't want you to be afraid. There is one instance, one rare instance, if you have a nodule that is autonomous at producing thyroid hormone, meaning you have an extra nodule that produces thyroid hormone on its own, which most nodules don't. The majority, like 98% will not do this, but if there's a nodule that is autonomous at producing its own thyroid hormones, that would be the only state where you should not take iodine. But guess what? If you take care of your body and if you get your body healthy and in a spot where it's taking care of those types of things on its own, that can be resolved and then you should be on iodine. There is a whole continuum of growing cysts on your thyroid, on your ovaries. Women, I just was somewhere with my aunt and my cousin two weeks ago, and my aunt was talking about her daughter who, oh my gosh, you know, she was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Syndrome is not a disease, people. Syndrome is a cluster of symptoms put together. Guess what? The number, the one of the Top things that causes polycystic ovaries is what? You grow cysts on your thyroid because of iodine deficiency. You grow lumps in your breast, your breast tissue gets all uh, irritated and lumpy because of iodine deficiency. You grow cysts on your ovaries because of iodine deficiency. Iodine is anti-cancer. It helps to prevent cancer. All of these tissues, like I was talking about with the breast, Iodine is responsible for keeping those tissues normal, consistent, and smooth, whatever shape and consistency they're supposed to be in. Iodine is key for that. Same thing in your ovaries. You need to be taking iodine if you have um, cysts anywhere and cysts on your ovaries. So cysts on the thyroid gland glow, go through a continuum. Okay, they first start out a little fluid filled, you know, there's a little cyst there, there's a little something going on, ah, but it's, you know, it's nothing. They've ultrasound it, maybe they did a biopsy, it's not cancer. Fantastic. Rarely is it cancer, 5% of the time it's going to be cancer. But then that cyst will change. The longer that it's iodine deficient, 
it's going to start to get hard. It gets hyperplastic and it gets, you know, just much more firm instead of being soft. And then so it goes through this continuum of getting bigger and harder and less iodine until it gets to the spot where it turns into a cancer. So to prevent cysts on your thyroid, you need to be taking iodine. If you have cysts on your, on your thyroid gland or anywhere else, when you start taking iodine, not only do your eyebrows grow back and your hair starts to grow and you start to get hair back on your legs and your cysts go away and you no longer have pain in your side because of your ovarian cyst, the cysts on your thyroid start to shrink and they start to go away because all they needed was iodine. Okay, so some really, really beautiful things. Every single cell in your body needs iodine. Every endocrine organ, the thyroid, your pancreas, your adrenal glands, that's your stress organ. If you're super stressed, you need to be taking iodine. It's going to help your adrenal gland. And don't forget, you have to be taking salt. Okay, here's an example of something that I have in at home. And I've just gotten back into adding salt into my water because I've been recommending it so often to people that I'm talking to that, you know what, first step we need to do, I want to get you started on iodine. You know, you've got this, this, and this going on. Your adrenal glands are tired. We need to get you on some salt. Salt is not bad for you. Now, the table salt that's been bleached, that's completely white, that doesn't stick together, that never clumps, that doesn't get hard, it's been chemicalized. And that is horrible for you. If you're eating a lot of processed foods, you're getting a ton of, I, or a ton of bad chemicals um, in the salt and a ton of salt in your processed foods. But you need to be taking unrefined salt, so Celtic salt, pink Himalayan salt, stuff that has little gritty stuff in it, and it's different colors. You want to know why that salt is so important with iodine? Because there's this little transporter system, the sodium iodide symporter. Oh my God, what does that mean? I could get so technical on all this stuff about iodine, but essentially... It means that the salt helps to transport the iodine in to the cells, into the gland. So without salt, without the sodium, iodine can't get in. So you can be taking iodine and the majority of it's going to be peed right on out because your cells didn't get any of it. And there's a lot of research around that as well. People as well. So again, I've got so much to tell you. All these little things that I'm blurting out to you now are because I don't have hours to tell you all about this. But why might somebody take iodine, eat a ton of fish? Maybe they're not eating the right fish that's giving them iodine, although ocean food, seafood will always give you more than what our vegetables and eggs and milk or things like that give us. Our soil is so depleted, specifically in the Midwest. We're very depleted. Our food doesn't give us much iodine because our food doesn't have much iodine because our soil doesn't have much iodine. So we're at a huge risk. But how many people have decreased the amount of seafood that they're eating because of contamination in the water, right? So a whole, whole big effect there. But when I think about somebody who takes iodine, there's some good research that shows, oh, iodine levels spike up in an hour and then they cleared it all in the next hour. Now, if somebody's clearing iodine that fast, did their cells get it? Nope. Their body absorbed it, kicked it right out. Why would their body do that? Well, there's some other chemicals that might be in your body that say, iodine, we don't want you. Get out. Okay, and if you guys remember that thing called the periodic table of elements, well, column number 17 is full of halogens, and halogens are chemically structured similar. Iodine is a halogen. It is in that column. Fluoride or fluorine is in that column as well. Bromine and chlorine along with the iodine. And then there's one more that is insignificant, and I don't know the name of that. It starts with an A, A-T. Um, those ingredients, look at my orange fingers. It's so funny. Ah. Um, those ingredients, fluoride. Hmm. Do you, do you get fluoride anywhere? Oh, my God, yes, the United States, such great health care. Put fluoride in the water and get tons and tons of fluoride. Guess what? Do you need fluoride? Do you need fluorine in your body? 
No, not one cell in your body needs fluorine, but guess what it does? It interferes with your thyroid function because it doesn't let you use iodine. It competes with the sites that iodine wants to get absorbed in. Hmm, bromine, horrible. Okay, iodine used to be in your bread products. We know that um, they add iodine to salt when they first discovered all this stuff about um, um, goiters, right? And that was helpful to help reduce goiters, but the salt is chemicalized, so that's horrible for us. You need unrefined salt to get iodine in where it's supposed to go. But if you are bromine toxic, you're not going to get the iodine in and your body's going to kick it right out. If you're fluoride toxic and chlorine toxic, your body's going to kick out the iodine. Ah, and then you've got a disaster. So maybe you're trying to take it, but the body can't get it in. We've got to detox those other chemicals out. So fluoride is in your toothpaste, people. That's why I talk about using a natural toothpaste that does not contain fluoride. There's a new product out there that I see so many people on Facebook sharing because it's whitening their teeth. And I asked to see the ingredients of that. And it is super, super, super high in fluoride. Did you know that fluoride toxicity can create white patches on your teeth? And then your teeth get soft and they get really, really white. But they're soft. And if your teeth are soft, how good are they going to chew? They're going to start to crumble and they're going to start to rot. So that's happening because people are wanting their teeth to be whiter. It's interfering with their thyroid. It's interfering with their breast. If you're a man, it's interfering with your, testos or your testicles and your prostate. Okay? Stop using fluoride in your toothpaste, please. And iodine used to be in your bread. And your body needs iodine, right? But... I don't know who made this decision. Somebody in the government said, let's stop putting iodine in our bread. We're going to put bromine in the bread. Bre um, bromine is a dough conditioner. It helps to make your bread super, super soft. But we talk about being gluten-free, so you're not eating any of that bread anymore, which is great for all of your organs as well. But people can get really, really toxic on the bromine. Guess what else it's in? It's not just in all of your pastas and your breads. It's in soda. Mountain Dew and Gatorade, top, top components. I met a young a teenager who actually developed a goiter because he drank a ton of Mountain Dew and it was interfering with his thyroid. We needed to give him a bunch of iodine to kick out some of that bromine. And actually that story brings me to some of you may have tried some iodine in the past and you say, oh no, I don't tolerate iodine. I can't take iodine or, oh, I'm allergic to iodine. You can't be allergic to iodine. You cannot be allergic to iodine. Your body has it inside. You would be allergic to yourself. Now, you might be allergic to fish, and there are proteins in some of those fish or some of those sea creatures that you can be allergic to and have an anaphylactic reaction. Not denying if you tell me that you had a reaction when you ate something like that, but it is not iodine. You can take iodine or maybe you've you know, had a surgery where they use povidine iodine and you may have broken out in a rash. It's not the iodine molecule that did it. It's the other stuff that was in that concoction that you're allergic to, okay? You cannot physically be allergic to iodine, but you can be allergic to other things that get put in an iodine product, okay? So let's get that out of the way. Um, I, I'm, I told you that because I was going to tell you something else and now I forgot what that is. Um, let me look through my notes because it's already been 24 minutes and I haven't told you half of the things that I want you to know about iodine. Um, we did talk about how um, it's very alkalizing. So those of you who are concerned about being too acidic, getting iodine in your body is very alkalizing. It's antibacterial. It's anti-cancer. Oh, Michelle, I just recently had thyroid removed due to thyroid cancer. Do I need iodine? Yes. You still need iodine. I'm sorry to hear that you had your thyroid taken out because you forever now are hypothyroid. You never, you, you don't ever want to lose an organ if you don't have to. But your thyroid uses iodine. Your breasts use iodine. Your white blood cells, which are responsible for fighting infection, need iodine or they don't function correctly. Every single cell in your body needs iodine. 
So yeah, we do. We're going to talk about a little bit of testing. Somebody asked a question about a supplement and yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that as well. If I don't answer your question when I'm talking live, please put it in the comments or send me a message. Okay. Because we can go through more things, but iodine in and of itself has superior properties and we got rid of it as a medical standard because it's messy. Okay. Because it stained my fingers. Am I worried about that? Actually, no, because guess what? My body's going to absorb it and it's going to go away. I'm watching this patch on my arm and I'm actually, it's actually almost gone. It is almost, almost gone, which it's getting really light. And I'm, I'm saying that and stuttering because I'm surprised because I take iodine on a daily basis. And the faster that this disappears, the more iodine I need to be taking. So now that I just looked at it and thought, wow, that got light in this last hour. And it's just been two hours, two and a half hours now. This is an iodine patch test. It's a crude way to test if you're iodine deficient. So take some over-the-counter iodine. Make a nice patch on your arm like I did. And this was bright orange when I started. I made a nice patch, do it like three by three, and you watch how fast does it go away. If this patch is still there in 12 hours, you don't need to take iodine. You're getting plenty. You have a ton of iodine. Remember that your skin absorbs anything and everything that you put on it within 28 seconds. So in 28 seconds, my body started to absorb this iodine. Great. And when the body knows that, ooh, we're getting iodine into the system, it's going to suck it in even faster. This is not a super accurate way to test if you're deficient, but it does give you a clue. Um, you can, the other way to test for iodine is through the urine. Um, there's a company called ZRT that does a spot urine test. If um, you're taking a bunch of iodine, that's not a great way to test for it. But if you're not taking iodine and you want to know if you're deficient or not, that would be the most appropriate thing to do. Um, you can have that test done. Another test um, done by a very specialty lab does a iodine loading test where you take 50 milligrams of iodine like tonight. The whole next day, you capture your urine. You collect it in a great big jug, and then you send off a sample size of your urine, and they test it. I told you before that iodine is excreted mostly through your urine. So what they do is calculate exactly how fast your kidneys excrete iodine from the dose of iodine that they gave you to determine exactly how deficient are you. Best way to test, if you're taking iodine already, um, that would be a great way to test it. If you just kind of want to know, do this for heaven's sakes. If it disappears in two hours, you're iodine deficient. But again, I live in the Midwest. Dr. Brownstein did a study of 600 patients. 95% of them were deficient in iodine. Okay. The recommended daily allowance, that RDA, which tells you to take 150 micrograms, is barely, barely enough to stop cancer from growing in a rat. You need to take a lot more. I take, I've, I've varied my dose. I take between 12.5 milligrams to 25 milligrams. Most recently, because I've been reading all about iodine again, I'm thinking I need to be taking more. You know, I took 25 milligrams for a period of time and then I bumped it down to 12.5. I'm not happy with how fast this is disappearing. I'm going to go back up to 25 and it's not going to flare my antibodies. It is a it is a process in your thyroid gland that hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, cyst development happens because your thyroid gland is missing iodine and it changes the chemical processes that are happening in there. So it actually triggers damage to happen because your thyroid needs enough iodine to put on um, the brake for the system. So there's an accelerator and there's a break for making hydrogen peroxide as well as thyroid peroxidase. So that's the TPO, and then we've heard of the TPO antibodies. Both of those, hydrogen peroxide and thyroid peroxidase, are needed in your thyroid gland to change iodide to iodine so that your thyroid can make T3 and T4. And T4 means... It has four iodine molecules, and T3 means it has three 
iodine molecules, and that's the active form of thyroid hormone. Without iodine, you cannot make thyroid hormone, period. If you are hypothyroid, you need iodine, guaranteed. You need more of the tools to just make the thyroid hormone. But again, once that happens, there's other chemical processes that needed that iodine too, and it keeps the hydrogen peroxide in balance. If there's too much hydrogen peroxide, it causes damage. It's oxidative. So the iodine keeps that in check so it doesn't cause damage. Now you're iodine deficient. Now you've got too much hydrogen peroxide. And guess what? The body senses there's damage going on. So what does it do? Your immune system is responsible for protecting you. So it makes antibodies to the TPO and to the thyroglobulin so that those antibodies come in and save the day from all of the destruction. But the problem is now there's a whole cascade of destruction going on in there instead of the balance and the calming down um, for the excess hydrogen peroxide. So I gave you that in a nutshell and you probably didn't understand it. Maybe you caught bits of it, but the point of the story is I'll do a whole autoimmune talk on that and explain that, but it's the lack of iodine that causes autoimmune thyroid disease to start in the first place. So there are so, so many diseases like asthma, like heart disease, breast disease, multitude of different cancers, lung disease, diabetes, having dry eyes, having infections in the gut because iodine is great at preventing infections. Ovarian cysts that I talked about, um, high blood pressure, sebaceous cysts, if anybody has those, and all of the thyroid disorders. Whole big long list of the medical research that's been done on conditions that can be prevented as long as you start taking iodine. Okay, guys, I am sorry that I have just blurted out a ton of information on iodine. If you want to be able to read through that in a, a, in a more thought out format, because I wrote this all out last night of, oh, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say this. And I wrote it all out and it was all flowing smoothly. And then I started talking to you about it today. And then I wanted to talk about that. And I wanted to talk about that. And I wanted to talk about that. So I've got it all written out for you. And it's a great resource for you. Again, I am just hitting iodine on a high level. What do I want you to get out of this? Iodine is great for you. Every single cell and organ in your body needs iodine. If you have a thyroid problem, I know you need iodine. If you have a breast problem, I know you need iodine. If you have cysts on your ovaries, I know you need iodine. If you're worried about prostate cancer, you need iodine, okay? Or if your prostate is a little bit enlarged, the iodine is going to help you with that. Okay, so sign up for my emails. Go to drkellyfelmer.com and this email will get put in on the, the queue to get sent out in the very near future. Um, so hopefully that'll be helpful for you. Let me review. What else did I not tell you about? Somebody asked about what supplement. Great question. I have Lugol's solution on my arm. Lugol's is iodine and potassium iodine. When you are taking an iodine supplement, the key thing to look for is iodide, with a D, and iodine, a combination of the two of those. Because different organs want one or the other. Your thyroid gland, the sodium iodide um, symporter, gets iodide into your thyroid. And then the TPO converts it to iodine inside the thyroid. That's how that process works. Liquid or capsules, it's, well, liquid, I would, that, that's hard to drink. Um, I wouldn't be drinking iodine. In a Lugol solution, two drops is about 12 milligrams of iodine. So it does last you a long time, and actually, that would be fine, and you can just put a couple drops in your water. I'm sorry, I was first just thinking, like, I would not drink it. I take a capsule. It doesn't matter from that perspective. What matters more is that your gut is working. Also, I, I briefly talked about bromine. That's where I was going. I got off on the tangent about allergies. Somebody can take iodine and get really sick. I spoke with a woman last week. She's like, oh, I've tried iodine before. And 
I, I had these flu-like symptoms. I was achy all over. I didn't feel good. It lasted for like a week and I had just started the iodine and then I stopped the iodine and all my symptoms went away. And I said, yeah, you are toxic and you were detoxing. That was bromine toxicity and probably also chlorine and fluoride as well. Iodine is a heavier molecule and it will bump those things out of your body. She felt like she had the flu and that was real because her body was toxic and it was getting rid of that. So vitamin C, magnesium, the salt are things that you can start to do to gently start to detox some of those things out of your body. And then slowly, what I usually do for those people is start them small on iodine and build them up on the amount of iodine so they don't feel like they have the flu. But that's absolutely what was happening with that woman. Yeah, she was having a real reaction. She did not feel good at all. But that just told me one more thing about her and how sick she really is. So that's why I was talking about that periodic table of elements. And chlorine you get in your water. You're getting it when you shower. You're getting it when you go to the YMCA and it's really, really chlorine-y, although they've, they've improved that as well. So think about all those different ways. Wherever you can decrease that, the exposure to those other halogens, your body is going to thank you for it. But when you start taking iodine, as long as your gut can absorb it and the magnesium and vitamin C will also help that process, you have to be taking salt with it or it won't get where it needs to go. Again, I used to have fibrocystic breast disease. When I first started taking iodine, gone immediately. And I can give you names of people, of women that I've worked with that have had the exact scenario um, change for them that, oh, you know, their, their breasts were always tender and they were really lumpy. And as soon as we started giving them iodine, that went away. Their body was just deficient. And guess what? The other beautiful thing about that, they noticed the change, but it also decreased, not eliminates, but decreased their risk for developing a breast cancer. Okay. So if you got any questions, how much should you start out with? Jill, great question. And different doctors will give you different recommendations. I'll tell you again, Dr. David Brownstein, his book is Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. Great. He, I met him in person. He is a fantastic man and he has taught me so, so much because he's researched this. He's seen it in all of his patients. He works with people like this all the time. And so I started to do exactly what he told me how to do. He is still more comfortable with iodine than I am. I start people small. He'll start somebody on 25 or 50 milligrams a day. But like that example that I just showed you of, um, or told you of that woman who had um, the toxicity effect going on, I start people more gently. His philosophy is that um, you, uh, he just, he bombards the body to get all that stuff out. But I have seen people not react well. And if I do that to you, you're probably going to say, I'm not taking that stuff anymore. So I'm a little more gentle. Dr. David Brownstein starts people on 25 milligrams and says most often in his practice, people are taking between 12 and 50 milligrams a day of iodine. I tend to start people at six milligrams along with the salt, the vitamin C and the magnesium. And then after a month of doing good on the six milligrams, I get them up to 12. And then based on if I'm treating or working with somebody with thyroid issues, looking at their thyroid hormones lets me know if they still need more. Okay. Remember as well that loading, iodine loading test will tell us exactly how deficient somebody is in iodine. So that can be a great judge to say, ooh, this person right off the bat needs 50 milligrams. Um, so the dose is variable. I tend to start people smaller and I build them up so that they will do well. Cheryl, thanks for um, the comment that this was information that you needed. I hope I answered your questions. Um, or things that you were thinking about. Again, do not fear iodine. You cannot be allergic to it, okay? If you're gonna take a supplement for it, make sure there's nothing else in that supplement. Iodide and iodine is what you want in there. I would start out small and I would build up because I think that's the safest way, but don't start taking it without salt.
salt, vitamin C, magnesium are also key things that help with those antibodies in your thyroid to cure your autoimmune disease. So again, autoimmune thyroid, I got to do a whole talk on that one night where I can talk longer because I've already talked 40 minutes and this is my Monday morning short information to get out to you and I've given you a ton of information. I hope it was super helpful. Um, so take it in, you know, take it in liquid, take it in a capsule. That's, that's fine. Um, will, will this help with goiter? Absolutely, Cheryl. The reason people get a goiter is because of iodine deficiency. The reason people get nodules is because of iodine deficiency. There are also other reasons. This is not all inclusive, but 97%, there was a study of 6,000 people. Worldwide, 97% of people are iodine deficient, okay? I think we're pretty safe with taking some iodine. Just joining, Christy says, iodine safe for Hashimoto's. Absolutely, that was one of the things I started with and gave um, tips on throughout the whole thing. I have Hashimoto's, I take iodine regularly. I also gave out the reference, Dr. David Brownstein helped me to be much more comfortable with iodine. There are many, many doctors who are afraid of using iodine. Again, because somebody starts it and they don't feel good on it. But I just gave you the biggest reasons why people don't feel good on it when they start. You can't be allergic to it. Almost every person is deficient in it. We can test for it. It is not, not, not fuel for the fire of autoimmune disease. One of the core reasons you started to have autoimmune disease is because of iodine deficiency. And I'll do a talk on that in the future. So yes, whoever answered that question, you've scrolled by. Good morning, Riley. Hi, Mel. Um, you can take iodine, but do it with a doctor who knows what they're doing, who can test you, who will test your hormones, who will test your antibodies, and who will help you work through detoxing your body of heavy metals and the bromine and the fluoride and the chlorine. You got to clean up your body. Selenium is also great if you're deficient in selenium, and it's one of the key things in autoimmune disease as well. So Joan, yes, you're absolutely right. Sarah, do you suggest making your own capsules? And if so, what is a good brand? Um, I, I don't suggest making your own. I would suggest getting um, uh, iodine solution, eating more of the foods that have iodine in it. And then again, um, what you want to look for, I don't have a brand to give you. It just needs to have iodide and iodine both in the capsule. So yes, Monica, Hashimoto's is safe to take iodine. If anyone told you, if you have read that it's not okay in autoimmune disease, they don't understand how the autoimmune disease started in the first place. And it gets created because your thyroid has lost its check and balance with the hydrogen peroxide, which causes destruction. Without iodine, there is no balance to bring in other organif organified lipids that calm down and mute the damaging effect of hydrogen peroxide. You have to have iodine to make that process happen and without it, it's out of balance and it makes also your thyroid hormones out of balance. I'm gonna do a whole little spiel on just that so you can feel more comfortable with that. Can you take too much? So Lynn, technically you could take too much, you'll just pee it out. Um, you do not need 100 milligrams of iodine today. I think 50 milligrams is a lot. That's why doing some testing and doing follow-up testing and looking at your thyroid hormones is one key way to see, are you taking enough? And one of the reasons why I start out small and I build people up. All right, good info here. Um, what are good numbers for iodine? So Pamela, it depends how you're tested um, because there's different ways to test it. And if you got tested, then you would see what's normal and what is not normal. But testing it in your blood is not really an accurate or good way to test it because it goes through your body so fast and because your um, organs absorb it. That's why the best tests are through the urine because, um, and the loading test is the most accurate because you've taken a specific dose of the iodine and they calculate how much you pee out. So if you didn't pee out very much, your body absorbed it. If you pee it all out, which you're supposed to pee out 90% of that 50 milligram tablet, 
then you're adequate. Then you have enough iodine. All right, so I'm looking back if there's any questions. If you have anything else that you want to address, please go ahead. I'm going to cut it off for our Monday now, but I'll look back and see if I didn't answer your question that you had written in the comments. I will try to address that. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Please be sure to, you know, communicate with me. Tell me if there's something you want me to talk about, and um, we will talk about it then. And send me your questions. Make sure that you share my videos because that helps me get exposed and it helps other people out there who need to hear this information too. So if you've appreciated this information, if it was helpful for you, share it with somebody else because they probably need it too. So have a great week. Happy Thanksgiving. And I'm going to talk about something on Wednesday night, the eve before Thanksgiving, and I will see you again then. Have a great day.